All right, so we're going to take a, a second look at um, implicit derivatives, and uh, I wanted to do it through a kind of a famous problem. And this this is kind of funny. Um, uh, in history, sometimes you get people with really, really big egos, and this is a story about a, a, a big ego situation. Rene Descartes, you know, Descartes was the one who actually uh, was uh, responsible for a lot of the mathematics we studied in math analysis. Um, if you recall Descartes' rule of signs, the Cartesian coordinate system, where you put X and Y, I mean, very, very significant mathematician. I have a picture of him up on my wall over here, literally one of the most famous mathematicians of all time, like hugely significant. Um, there's another guy named Fermat. Fermat, also hugely significant. Um, he's actually driven some of the, the, the mathematics that to this day people are trying to figure out. Um, Fermat was not quite as prideful, though, as Descartes. And so Descartes had a question, and he posed this to Fermat and said, hey, I bet you can't solve this. Well, the reality is he couldn't solve it. He didn't know how to solve this particular problem, but he threw it out there at Fermat as a challenge, like, hey, hey, I got a great problem here. I bet you can't solve it. Well, Fermat did solve it. Descartes couldn't solve it. And so we're going to take a look at some of the problems. And what Descartes was saying is, hey, I bet you can't find the slope of the tangent anywhere on the curve. And Fermat's like, all right, I got this, and you will too. So let's take a look at it. So um, here we're going to start with, actually, you know, before I do that, let's go ahead and take a look at what the picture of this particular curve actually is. I'm going to pull my Desmos back up. There we are. So this is the curve that we're referring to, and it's called the folium of Descartes. And the folium of Descartes actually technically just has an A right here. And so depending on the size of A is the size of this little loop-de-loop -loop that's sitting right there that you can see. So um, I chose to make a nine for the sake of the problem we're gonna look at today. But uh, anyway, that's called the folium of Descartes, known after Descartes, but he was the one that couldn't solve it. Fermat did it. Fermat's a bit of a booger. He really is. Um, he he posed some problems that have driven people absolutely, literally insane. So let's check a look at this problem, the folium of Descartes. Now, Descartes had these problems right here. X cubed plus Y cubed equals negative 9XY equals zero. This value right here, this coefficient could change to all sorts of different numbers. Um, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and find Y prime or dy dx. So here we go. We've got three X squared. We've got three Y squared times dy dx. That was pretty simple. Remember chain rule, we take the derivative of three y three times ugly to the second, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside. Right here, we have a little product rule. So if we consider this the first, the derivative of f would be negative nine. The derivative of the second would be dy dx times the first, which is negative nine x. And of course, the derivative of zero is zero, no big, okay. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take the pieces that have a dy dx in them, which happen to be this chunk right here and this chunk right there, and we're going to group those together as a 3y squared and a negative 9x, and we're going to set that equal to, um, I guess, 9y and a minus 3x squared, because I'm going to move these two things to the other side. And what you see is what Fermat did is he came up with a system that was very simple to go through the process and find dy dx. But what he didn't do is he didn't make sure that x was by itself because in this problem, I don't think we still know how to get x by itself in a problem of this complexity. See, this is something that the, one of the smartest math minds of all time couldn't do because he didn't have this technique of implicit differentiation that Fermat had um, either figured out or learned from somebody else. That portion I have not studied, but Fermat definitely knew how to do this. Now, what I'd like to do, though, as a carry on with this problem, is I'd actually like to go ahead and take a look at one other piece within this video. So what we have right here is um, 
this problem that has this kind of loop-de-loop. And I'd like to know where is this top and where is this place? So where is the tangent horizontal and where is it vertical? That is a harder problem. And um, we can actually do that. It, it does take a little bit of effort, but I think it's worth it because it demonstrates a skill that I would really like you to know. So back to our story. So if we have a situation where we would like to find where there is a vertical asymptote. So keep in mind, if you have a vertical asymptote, that's going to happen where the denominator is equal to zero. So we would be saying then, I want to find out when is 3y squared minus 9x zero. Okay. Well, interestingly enough, then we could do a little bit further, and then we could say then that 3y squared is positive 9x, or you could say x is equal to one-third of y squared. Now, that doesn't seem all of that bad, but that still doesn't get me anything because I still have these two unknowns. But if you go back to the original problem, which is what we're going to do, is we're going to substitute this into the original problem and find out in the original problem, in the derivative, it makes it zero, but what happens in the original problem? So this says I have x cubed plus y cubed minus 9xy is zero. So, but everywhere I saw an x, I'm going to replace it with a one third y squared. Now, You've done enough of problems over time to realize that if we have taken a problem that had two unknowns and reduced it down to one unknown, this is a problem we probably can go get. And so we have one third cubed is 127. That's y to the sixth. Nine times one third is three. And um, you'll notice that we have um, some like terms right here of y cubed. So I'm going to go ahead and simplify that down a smidgen more. And I'm down to here. And um, I'm not a huge fan of that 27th to sitting there. So let's multiply everything through by 27. And I'll give that step completely, completely optional. But that gets me to a spot where what I could do is I could see that both of these things have at least a y cubed in common. Now, if they have a y cubed in common, then I could factor that out and leave a y cubed minus 54 is zero. So that leads me to two places. That we will have a vertical asymptote wherever this is true. This is true when this product right here is zero, but that would happen, of course, if y itself was zero or if y itself was the cube root of 54. Now, as it turns out, 54 is two times three times three times three. So there is actually a cube root sitting right here. So it'd be three cube roots of two. Now, that may seem like, okay, that's no big deal, but keep in mind, we got this little story over here. Check it out. So if I know what y is, look what happens. If I square y and multiply it by one third, I've got x. That was no big deal. Now let's try this one over here. Um, let's see, three cube roots of two. Sorry, that looks a little ugly. Now let's go over here and let's take and plug that in to y. I'm going to take three cube roots of two, and I'm going to square that, and I'm going to find x. So if I square that, three squared, of course, is nine. The cube root of two squared is the cube root of four. That would be x. So if I distributed that, I would get three times the cube root of four. So that's what we have. So if you go back over here to my previous screen, Let's go back to share screen because I already have that ready. What you'll notice is right here, I have three cube roots of four for X and three cube roots of two for Y as one of the places where the tangent was vertical. You can see that's a vertical line right there. We also have a vertical line at zero comma zero. But that's kind of weird because it's like, if you look, it looks like you might say that's a horizontal tangent right here coming from left to right. But as you loop around the thing right here, it does have vertical at that place. So there's actually two distinct tangents 
at that moment, which we're going to see here in a second. So back to our question, I'd also like to know when is this thing horizontal? And that might seem like, oh, no, we have a long way to go, but you're going to find out it's not as bad as it looks. So here we go. Let's find out when it is horizontal. I actually just changed colors. On, so I'm going to go back. So a horizontal tangent happens not when the denominator is zero, but when the numerator is zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 9y minus 3x squared equal to zero. And I'm going to follow the same process I did in the previous, bring that across. Let's divide both sides by 9, and I got 1 third x squared is y. Now you should see some symmetry. Notice we had 1 third y squared is x, y is 1 third x squared. So if we go in there and decide, hey, let's just go ahead and plug that into the original problem, I have x cubed plus y cubed minus 9xy is zero, but I'm gonna replace each of the y's with 1 third x squared, 1 third x squared. I'm actually gonna stop right there because what you should notice, I'm gonna highlight that in green, is if you look at this line right here and this line right here, that's exactly the same information. That's, I think right there we can see it. That's exactly the same elements. I have my one-third x squared cubed. I have my x cubed. I have all of these things are exactly the same as what we had before. So when we did all of these things, we found that y was zero and y was the cube root of 54. So now we're going to get x equals zero and x equals the cube root of 54. And because of the symmetry of the argument, all that's going to do is it's going to take the original answers that we got and it's going to flip them. Because if you go back, we know that if you plugged in zero, you got zero. So if you plugged in zero, you got zero. I mean, it just goes together. And then if we plugged in the cube root of 54, which we already figured out could be uh, simplified to um, three cube roots of two, but then you go back and you plug this in here for x, just like what we did before, we're going to end up with the exact same result that we got before, which is three cube roots of three cube roots of four. And so I have that also in the screen. And so you can see that, that not only did we find the vertical tangent, but we also found the horizontal tangent, because if you just reverse the coordinates, because of the symmetry of the curve. This is where it was horizontal. This is where it's vertical. And this place is crazy because it's both, because it depends on which pass around that point you're talking about. So that should be quite a nice little journey. Um, the first part I think was fairly straightforward, but I would like you to really stop and think about what makes something vertical. Again, vertical happens when the denominator equals zero, so notice I took that denominator and I set it to equal zero and horizontal happens when the numerator right here, when the numerator hits zero. Now this was a very special problem. So that symmetry doesn't exist in most problems where we can kind of get away with doing something very simple, but that's one of the reasons people study it. All right, I'll see you back in class.